without warning, preferring death in battle to starvation on Mons Lactarius. 11,000 Ostrogothic warriors charged the overwhelming Byzantine army, knowing very well that this would be their last battle. A battle that would go down in history as one of the most iconic last stands is just about to begin. It's the year 551. More than 15 years have passed since Belisarius' feudal attempts to reconquer Italy for the Roman Empire and the revival of the Ostrogothic Kingdom under King Totila. Now it's up to Emperor Justinian's other general, Narcissus, to accomplish what Belisarius could not. Setting out from Salona with a massive invasion force consisting of the entire Roman army provided by the Byzantine Emperor. Following him closely behind is John, called the Glutton, with his own army consisting of fierce Roman infantrymen. As they marched along the east coast of the Adriatic Sea, heading further into the Ostrogothic Kingdom, they were joined by yet another force, mainly consisting of 5,000 Langobardic horsemen under the rule of Alboin, who had been won over by Justinian's promises of vast amounts of gold. While Narsus cut deeper and deeper into Gothic territory, Totila, the Ostrogothic king, though it was him who had reconquered Italy after the first Byzantine invasion, remained surprisingly unconcerned, but ultimately mustered a fresh contingent of cavalrymen under the leadership of Taya, one of his most renowned warriors. In order to buy as much time as possible to gather an army big enough to beat the Byzantine invasion force, Totila sent him to the Gothic-controlled city of Verona. As Taya crossed the Po River, he ordered his men to construct ditches and gullies and even managed to turn the entire regions bordering the river into swampland, shutting off any roads towards Rome. One path, however, Taya left untouched. The path along the coastline, where many rivers eventually flow into the Adriatic Sea. Totila calculated that the Romans wouldn't have enough ships to ferry the whole army in one body across the sea. But if Narcissus was bold enough to transport his army in small groups, it would hardly be any trouble for Totila to destroy the disembarking units. When Narsus reached a point near Venetia, he sent a messenger to the Franks stationed in the fortress, demanding free passage for his army. The Franks, however, bluntly refused his request, hiding their real reason, possibly because of their own interests to conquer Italy, or their goodwill towards the Goths. At first, Narsus was confused by this, but when eventually the news reached him that Taya had made the roads to Ravenna almost entirely impassable, Narsus was in complete shock. John, however, who was familiar with these regions, just as Totila hoped, advised him to proceed with the whole army along the coastline. But John had an ace up his sleeve. He ordered his ships and boats who accompanied them to create ponton bridges whenever they encountered a river, making the crossing comparatively easy. Thanks to John's cunningness, Narsus was able to avoid Totila's trap and safely reach the Roman-controlled city of Ravenna, former capital of the Ostrogothic Kingdom. After learning what had taken place in Venetia, Totila at first remained in the vicinity of Rome to await Taya's cavalry contingent. But when the majority arrived and only 2,000 horsemen were still missing, Totila, without awaiting the rest, set out to meet the Romans in battle. Near a village called Tagini, at a place known as Busta Galorum, Named after Gallic grave mounds, the Romans finally encountered the Goths, resulting in a decisive Byzantine victory, dealing a massive blow to the Goths. As a result, more than a third of Totila's army perished in battle, or were slain after putting themselves into Roman hands. Totila himself was either severely wounded in battle or on his flight, and not long after, died from his wounds. As for the Goths who managed to save themselves from being slaughtered by fleeing from the battle, they retreated beyond the Po River and occupied the city of Ticinum. Following the Battle of Tagini, Narsus sent Valerian north to lay siege to the Gothic city of Verona. But when Narsus learned that the Goths had appointed Taya as their new ruler, ordered Valerian to end the siege and maintain a guard with all his troops near the Po River. Narsus himself, however, turned his attention towards Rome, which after a short but intense siege, fell into Byzantine hands. Taya, meanwhile, began to reorganize what remained of his army after the slaughter at the Busta Galorum and restored the Gothic forces as well as possible. He also found all the gold Totila had left in the city years before. As Taya considered his force not a match for the Roman army, he sent all this gold to the Frankish king Theudibald 
in order to encourage him into an alliance. Thudibald, however, never responded, as he was himself rather interested in conquering Italy and unwilling to die for neither Goths nor Romans. Totila had left most of the Gothic gold not in Ticinum, but rather in Cumi, a well-protected fortress in Campania. And when Narcissus received note of this, he immediately dispatched a small force to besiege the fortress, while he himself stayed in Rome. Taya, on the other side, started losing his hope about an alliance with the Franks. And in order to help his brother Aligern, who was bravely defending the Gothic horde at Cumi, made the difficult decision to march his remaining army towards Campania, a journey from which many of the Goths would never return. When Narcissus realized what was happening, he immediately ordered John with his own army to guard the passage through Tuscany to ensure that the capture of Cumi was unhindered. Taya, however, didn't move through Tuscany, but rather proceeded along the coast of the Adriatic Sea, completely managing to elude both Valerian and John, causing Narcissus to summon them back. Reunited, Narcissus then marched with his entire force towards Campania, swiftly cutting off the Goths near Mount Vesuvius at a small, deep river called Draken. The Goths, however, had seized the bridge over the river, since they encamped very near it and had constructed wooden towers mounted with ballista guarding the bridge. As a result, hand-to-hand -hand combat was impossible. But as the river wasn't very wide, both sides started shooting at each other using bows and javelins. Some single encounters also took place, when some Goth, on occasion, in answer to a challenge, crossed the bridge. This situation resulted in a stalemate, and it wasn't until two months later, when the Goths were betrayed by one of their own in charge of their supplies and provisions, that the Romans started constructing their own ballista tower, which forced the now starving Goths to yield their position and seek refuge on the nearby mountain called Mons Lactarius. Due to its rough terrain, the Roman army was unable to follow them there. But it wasn't long until the Goths regretted going up onto Mons Lactarius, since they still lacked food for both themselves and their horses. As the situation for the trapped Gothic warriors and civilians grew more desperate, and preferring death in battle to starvation, the Ostrogothic army charged the unexpected, unorganized Byzantine army, causing immediate and massive results, cutting deep into Byzantine lines. The Romans tried to ward them off as well as circumstances allowed them, struggling to form defensive positions. But many paid for their moment of abstraction, the ultimate price. The Gothic army consisted of roughly 11,000, while the Romans were most likely more than twice as many. Fighting in the very center of the battle, in the front of the Gothic phalanx, was none other than Taya himself, while ordering his own cavalry to dismount their horses and join him in the Gothic lines. Also realizing that the rough terrain was ill-suited for cavalry movement, Narcissus, who finally managed to restore order to the Roman lines, too decided to dismount his own cavalry. The Goths, on one hand, were fighting for their existence in the despair of the situation. The Romans, on the other, though they could see that the enemy had become desperate, weren't eager to lose to a numerically inferior opponent. The Romans fighting in the front, seeking glory in a swift victory, concentrated all their attention on Taya, focusing him with their spears and javelin throws. So much so, that Taya had to constantly change his shield for a fresh one, once it became unwieldy and too heavy to hold. But despite this, Taya managed to block all incoming javelins with his shield, and was even able to slay many Roman soldiers by making sudden charges. The fight continued to rage on, with heavy casualties on both sides. But as the day was already drawing to a close, Taya, whose shield was once again weighed down by 12 spears, had requested a new shield from his bodyguards without giving any ground to the enemy. But as he reached for his new shield, his chest became exposed for a split second, just as a javelin hit him. Taya, the king of the Ostrogoths, was dead. But the Goths, though they could see that their king had made his last breath, didn't surrender as the Romans had hoped, but instead continued to fight even more fiercely against the overwhelming Byzantine forces, until it grew dark and both armies fell back to sleep near the battlefield. On the following day before the sunrise, the battle continued just like on the day before, with both sides fighting like wild beasts, fueled by their intense hatred of one another. The Goths being well aware that they were fighting their last battle, and the Romans refusing to be defeated by their considerably weaker opponent. 
But finally, as the end of the second day grew closer, the Goths sent one of their leaders to Narsis, offering to abandon their struggle on the condition that they were granted a peaceful withdrawal as free men by Narsis, not begrudging them reasonable terms, but even presenting them with their own money in Kumi as traveling funds. Narsis took this offer into consideration and turned to John who advised him to allow their request, saying, For victory is sufficient for the wise, but extravagant desires might perhaps turn out even to a man's disadvantage. Amid negotiations, a group of a thousand Goths under the leadership of a Goth called Indolf unexpectedly left the area and returned to the Gothic stronghold of Ticinum to offer further resistance while the rest gave sworn pledges to uphold their agreement, and immediately left Italy and eventually settled in South Tyrol. Aladurn finally surrendered Cumi to the Romans, and Narsis went on to capture what remained of the Ostrogothic kingdom, marking the end of the Gothic War. Finally, after many years, Italy was, even if only for a short time, once more reunited with the Roman Empire.